Well, we continue this morning in the book of First John. We're in chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. I invite you to turn there. First John, chapter 4, reading verses 13 to 16. And John writes, By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. Father, we come to open up your word today. And we have spent quite a number of weeks looking at what John laid out by your spirits moving about who you are and what you produce in us and the kind of assurance you can grant us. I pray this morning that as we turn to this passage, you will give assurance to those who are yours and challenge to those who are not. For I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. John is writing about being sure. He insists that God wants us to know that we are his children, that our children, our Christian experience is real. If you sometimes ask a person the question, do you know that you're saved? And you get, I hope so. You've missed what God wants to do, which is, I know so. And there are ways of knowing. At the heart of the Christian claim is the conviction that God lives in us and that his love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. The two phrases with which the previous paragraph concluded are now taken up and developed. And in verses 13 to 16, that God lives in us, and then in verses 17 to 21, that God's love is made complete in us. This morning we're going to deal with the first one, that God lives in us. And that in January, the next time I preach in the new year, uh, with verses 17 to 21, that his love is made complete in us. The proof of our salvation is that we live in him and he in us. We live in him and he lives in us. And it says that in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The Apostle Paul describes the same thing this way, where he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And in his gospel, John put it this way, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John then provides three evidences. And as we consider them, we will discover that the second and third are developments of the first. We know that we live in God because he's given us his spirit. We know that he's given us his spirit because we've come to confess that Jesus is the son of God. And we know he's given us his spirit because we've begun to dwell in love. So I've already told you where we're going this morning. Let's just flesh out those three ideas. First, we know that we live in God because he's given us his spirit. When you were born again, when I was born again, it might not have seemed like anything happened, but at that moment, a number of things took place. First of all, our sins were forgiven. I mean, that's just a huge load. And if you've ever been alongside of someone who comes to Christ midlife, you know the the burden that they felt has been lifted when they know that Christ has forgiven their sins. So one of the things that happens at the time that you're born anew is that your sins are forgiven. That you also were adopted into God's family. You now are by, by the work of Jesus Christ made a brother or sister of his and adopted into God's family. Thirdly, we were united with Christ It's described in Romans chapter 6 that we now have become one with Christ. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. And all of a sudden, 
you have that identity. Fourthly, we were given a new nature. Before that, you could not not sin. But with a new nature, the heart of flesh instead of the heart of stone, you now have the ability to choose right, to draw close to God, to want his ways. And fifthly, we received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit took up residence inside our spirit. And we received all of him. He is not given in installments. Well, I'll give you part of him today and part tomorrow and more next week. You received the Holy Spirit. All in that one moment when you asked the Lord to save you. And he did all of those things. Now, the Holy Spirit is a person, one and indivisible. So while it's not possible for us to have less than all of him, it is possible that he has less than all of us. And the reality is we grow in Christ, we need more and more to give ourselves into his care and under his leadership. Hence the necessity of Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. The reality is we leak. That uh, we don't continue to have the fullness of Christ, uh, Christ's Spirit in us. That we allow Him to diffuse. And so we need to be filled over and over and over again towards being able to walk in His power and with His strength. So as we opened our lives in totality to God, we discover what it is to be constantly energized and directed by the Spirit of God. And it should be as we get older, we understand that more, not less. It should be as we get further on in life in our walk with Christ that we recognize our need of every day His filling more than we did even when we started on that walk. Now, the reality is this, that the natural man does not possess the Holy Spirit nor the things of the Spirit for the things of the Spirit are foolishness to him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, verse 9, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And you and I, as we live our lives, rub shoulders day after day with all kinds of people who are dead in trespasses and sins, who are what's described here as the natural man who haven't got a clue what it means that you understand that Christ is in your life and he walks with you by his spirit. For the natural man does not have that. But we have that. The corollary of that then, that the natural man, is that the evidence for us is we have some things that show up in our lives precisely because the spirit of God inhabits us. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The natural man can neither believe nor love. It has fallen in unredeemed state. He is both blind and selfish. It's only by the Holy Spirit that man ever comes to believe in Christ and to love others. So the first evidence that we belong to God is that he has given us his spirit to indwell us. The second evidence that John provides here is this. Because we have come to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. That's in verses 14 and 15. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. John ties the witness of the, of the Spirit experientially to the testimony of the apostles historically. I'll give you three passages. In John 15, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And in 2 Peter, and that was from John, from Peter, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Paul wrote this way, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So when we come to verse 15, John refers to uh, the outward confession which stems from the inward conviction. He's saying that the assurance you have that the Spirit is with you is the fact that you're willing and able to verbally confess your faith in Christ. You acknowledge more than simply intellectual assent, but it's not less than that. The salvation is more than intellectual assent, but it's not less than that. Saving faith rests not simply upon a warm feeling. Oh, I feel so close to God. That's not the issue. It's, it's not simply a, resting in a warm feeling or even positive notions. Well, a loving God would always accept me. But rather, it's a confession which is theologically accurate. And it's obviously life transforming because it will be seen by two things. One is obedience to the commands of Christ. And the other is growing like him in character. In other words, the assurance that the Holy Spirit is in you sees the following of your willingness to profess him publicly, to obey what he's told you to do, and to grow like him in your character more and more each day. No one comes to acknowledge the truth concerning Jesus except by the Holy Spirit. It is his work that draw, drew you to Christ. Therefore, I want you to understand, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So the second evidence is that we have come to acknowledge and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The first one is that you have the presence of the Spirit in your life. And that inner witness is real. The second one is that we have moved to the place where we've come to acknowledge and we can proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Savior and He is the Son of God. Which brings us to the third evidence. Because we have begun to dwell in love. In verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Here's the third evidence that God lives in us, that we live in him. Namely, that the love that was eternally in God and historically manifested in Jesus is being demonstrated visibly in us. We've made the claim during this, we've read this book, that God is love. And what we're making the claim today is that when you became a believer, you got his nature. And so the third evidence that you are saved, the third evidence that gives you security as you walk, is the fact that you have now an attitude of love that wasn't there before, that doesn't come naturally to you, but because God is love, you love in the way that he loves. And we've spent lots of time as we've gone through this, epistle, this little book seeing that that's true. So the conclusion that we come to is this. Are you sure that God lives in you? You say, yeah, I'm sure. The Holy Spirit, he has given me a spirit. But true belief and love are not conditions of dwelling in God. The rather, they're the evidences of it. You don't have to learn how to do this to be in Christ. You don't have to, to practice this to prove that you're in Christ. The fact that you're in Christ will have these as the natural fruit that outflows. We may not yet be all that we could be, but we are different from our non-Christian friends whose minds are dark and whose hearts are cold. Only the Holy Spirit can enlighten our minds to believe in Jesus and then warm our hearts to love God and each other. Remember the promise of the Old Testament? We won't, he'll take away the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, a heart that's God's heart and loves. So when someone claims to be a Christian but has no time for fellowship with others or has no time for the study of God's word 
when they criticize the church, writing it off of a, as a, for sol solitary devotion instead? Do we not have to ask whether the person is actually deluded? Does not really understand what it means to belong to Christ if they think they can live that way? And whether God really does live in him? For the reality is this, my friends. When the life of God is at work in you, it sweetens bitterness, it melts harshness, and it multiplies love. We're going to come to the communion table this morning. And as we come to the table, we're going to sing a hymn that may not be familiar to you, but I hope it becomes so. It was written in the middle of the uh, 1800s, but it became powerfully used during the Welsh revival of 1902, 3, or 4 in that period of time. It has four verses. The first two talk about the blessedness of what God has done for us. And the second two talk about our response to that. And it, there's no more fitting hymn to sing, to come to communion, than this one, which is, here is love, vast as the ocean. <laughs>